Hello, everyone. I'm Shuya, and today I'm going to discuss the spatial concepts of ethnic minorities in Sichuan. So as you may already know that Western Sichuan is also known as a very, uh, it also has a very particular name called as Sichuan Ethnic Corridor or Sichuan Yunnan Ethnic Corridor, because this part of China is famous for its ethno-linguistic diversity. Uh, today, I'll show you the case of the Yarong people, which I have been studying over the past uh, few years. So, you may find the spelling of the name Yarong seem a little strange. Is that strange to you? It's not an English word, right? Actually, this name comes from the tra Tibetan transliteration, and the literal means the Gemo Tawarong, so the warm land of the queen. And historically, this is a name that referred to the 18 Garong chieftains in Western Sichuan during the Ming and the Qing dynasty, dynasties called at Jiarong uh, Shiba Tu Si. So maybe some of you have already heard the name. And nowadays, most of the inhabitants in this area are identified as a distinct ethnic minority known as an, uh, as the Garong Tibetans, Jiarong Zhangzhu, although they are not the Tibetan in a strict sense. However, despite the Gyarong people uh, who are religiously and culturally influenced by the Tibetans, uh, I would say that they, at least from the linguistic perspective, the Gyarong people speak a group of languages known as the Gyarong languages, which is not uh, which do not belong to the Tibetic uh, subgroup in Sino-Tibetan. And I would say that the Gyarong languages are only considered as a very remote relatives of the. Tibetic languages or the Tibetan dialects. So this map illustrates the geographic locations of the Gyarong speaking zone. So I choose uh, a neutral term. So in order to, to create some ambiguities between the Gyarong Tibetans or Gyarong people or Tibetan dialects. So let's say, just say it as Gyarong speaking areas. So with these red spots, and we can see that these places are primarily concentrated in parts of the Two, two autonomous prefectures. So the first one is, sorry, here, the Aba Zhangbu Qiangbu Zizhou, the Aba Tibetan and the Qiang Autonomous Prefecture. And the second is the Ganzi Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. So here, the Ganzi Tibetan Autom Autonomous Prefecture. So this, are the, this is a geographic location of the Gyarong speaking zone for the Gyarong Tibetans. And this photo was taken during a interview with of me with the local Gyarong people. So drawing from my past fieldwork experience, I would say that even if you can accurately transcribe and gloss every morphemes of the of a Gyarong text, you may still encounter challenges in understanding the content. Why? So this is because in addition to the widely acknowledged phonological and morphological complexity of the Gyarong languages, these languages are also distinguished by their pervasive reference to the space and in a very distinct manner. So we, we, we can we have considered that this manner is distinct at least from the adjacent Mandarin speakers or the Tibetan speakers. And I believe this characteristic could be related to one feature that is the local eco, uh, ecological environment. So here we have a photo. So the, the Gyarong people reside in the mountainous region in Northwestern Sichuan. So this photo depicts a typical Gyarong village. So you can see here we have many houses okay so we have many houses here and there is a very special building which is a ancient uh Brexton chieftain's palace so now it is a it's a relic so this uh this photo represents a typical Gyarong, a, a typical type of Gyarong village uh, nestled in the middle of the high mountains and often exceedingly difficult for outsiders to access and now another photo. So the second picture displays a different style of Gyarong village situated at the foot of the mountain and alongside a river. So I believe you already noticed the prominent topographic feature in this area. So that is, we have high mountains, deep valleys, and swift rivers. So imagine that if you, if you live in such kind of area, how would you locate yourself if you are in the high mountains or just uh, uh, inside uh, in, in the foot of the mountain or near the river. So possibly you will not choose left, right or front, back. So 
the local topography serves as the primary reference for the special concepts of the Garong people. So we have a figure on the left, uh, which is the local landscape I, I showed you just now. And we have another figure on the right, which illustrates the three axes abstract from the local landscape. So here we have, show you the first one. So we have a vertical one. So the vertical axis uh, representing the verticality or the gravity that is up and down. And the second one, is, it can be roughly understood as uh, the mountain inclination or the slope. So it's not difficult to imagine that we can have concepts like uphill or downhill. And the third one here, so it coincides with the river. So normally we would expect concepts like up river and the down river. So let me just briefly summarize the three axes. The axis abstracted from the local landscape. So axis one represents the vertical dimension reflecting up and downward directions. So axis two roughly aligns with the mountain slope. Uh, well, axis three corresponds to the local river, up river, down river. So another important feature of the three axes is that they are orthogonal to each other. So back to the vertical axis, we have the up down. So it's it's almost perpendicular to the horizontal plane that is our living space, right? So here we are in the horizontal plane and we have verticality up and down. And on the horizontal plane, so our living space, we have two axes, axis two and three that coincide with the mountain and the river respectively. They are also perpendicular to each other like a, like a cross, right? So to illustrate the functioning of these three axes, I will use uh, one variety of the Gyeongmo language that is Brawash as an example. The Brawash Gyeongmo as an example. But now we encounter the first difficulty, which lies in the grammar. So remember the three axes I mentioned just now, one, two, three. Each axis comprises two opp opposite orientations, which I propose a few semantic labels. So we have for axis one, we have up and down. For axis two, we have uphill, downhill, and so on. And we, uh, I will explain this later. And for axis three, we have up river and down river. And each orientation opposition is lexicalized in morphemes from different word classes. So we have here orientation nouns typically take typical typically taking a ah prefix, ado up, ah uh, upward. Avi or ave, downward, ato, uphill, are, downhill, au, ana, and so on. And we also have adverbs. So they are adverbs, adverbs meaning towards, you know, towards a particular direction, and it encodes the, the same direction as the noun. And we have verbal prefixes that are occurring before the verbs then, that we have two verbs. That means, for example, means go upward, and datot means to take something upward. So they are all expressed by the uh, by. So each orientation is lexicalized in, we I would say a set of different, uh, a set of morphemes, uh, or an orientation set. So for the upward direction, we have ado as a noun, sto as an adverb, and er uh, as a verbal prefix, and date dato, and so on. Mm, we will see in later examples how these morphemes serve to indicate direction. But let us first focus on the semantics. So the three axes uh, I mentioned just now, de de despite the label I used, are actually in many contexts polysemous and adapted should be adapted to the local topography. So this poses challenges when seeking a proper Chinese or English or something else, uh, a proper translation. A typical example is axis two that I mentioned just now as coinciding with the mountain slope, but actually it is very polysemous. It had has multiple semantic realizations depend, depending on the focus. So this part, so if we focus on the mountain hill, so axis two means uphill, downhill. But when we go down and reach the river, uphill, downhill, I don't think this semantics work. So instead of uphill, downhill, when we focus on the river, the, this the same axis, means this time this bank or this shore and the and the opposite bank opposite shore so you may find a little strange uphill downhill this bank that bank they they do not seem to 
have a certain connection to be connected um, under one axis. But upon a closer observation, it is not difficult to, dis uh, to discern that all these semantics satisfy with one principle, that is, so no matter where we are, so if we are in mountain or we are close to the river, the axis two is always orthogonal to the rivering axis, uh, axis three. So we have the axis three here, up river, down river, and we always have an axis that is that is perpendicular to the axis three. So if we are focused on the mountain slope, we have uphill, downhill. It it is realized as uphill, downhill. But if if we focus on the river, it is realized as this bank or the and the opposite bank. We can also focus on both the mountain and the river. So and this time uh, and this time axis two is realized as towards the mountain or towards the river, right? So the realization is always orthogonal to the river. So we shall begin with the nominal forms from the axis two and F axis three that, that coincide roughly with the river and the mountain. So below we have a table. This table, uh, in this table, we have two paradigms. So here we have the paradigm for the orientation noun that begins with the a prefix. And we have another paradigm for the possessive forms. So we have a possessive prefix here. We have the n as an example, which, which means my. So if we add this prefix to a noun, it means my something. Okay. So we have, uh, I'm not sure what this is clear enough to, to show the color difference. Uh, so we have four points here, A, B, C, D. And the four points represent the four orientations consisting of the axis two and three. So the rivering axis is uh, indicated in blue. So, okay. hmm. Here it's in blue, C and C and D. So uh, we can see for the four in C and D, we can see that there are two orientation nouns, awu and anu in the orientation noun paradigm. So awu and anu mean up, upstream or upriver direction and downriver down, uh, downstream direction respectively and and if we change to the possessive paradigm we have the no prefix instead of the a prefix so no means my side so if imagine that i'm in the mountains so adding the personal possessive pre prefix no means my side facing towards the up uh, upstream direction and the uh, ne means my side facing the downstream direction so maybe this English tr translation is awkward but uh, perhaps you have better suggestions but let's just imagine the situation and point a and b from the axis two are more intricate so envision yourself on a mountain road here I have a a simple sketch here so this this time we have a and b so imagine you are here and we have a, a river just below so just now i mentioned this the rivering axis my side facing the upstream direction and my side facing the downstream direction and now what about the a and b that is also going on to the river uh how would you describe a and b in your own eyes any ideas um, so we agree that A and B, at least we have two orientation nouns here, Ato and Are. So what do they mean? Perhaps in order to be orthogonal to the river, we have maybe close to the mountain or close to the river because the river is just outside. And in such a situation, the side near to the mountain is also higher, right? Because the, the mountain here goes higher. So it's also higher place, inner part, and also um, near to the mountain. And the, the B, the opposite orientation, it's maybe it's lower, right? And it's outside, right? It's closer to the river. So I propose the translation for Ado and Arde. Uh, sorry, Ado and Arde. So A, Ado means higher interior side towards the mountain, and Arde lower in exterior side facing the river so now let's look at the possessive paradigm so 
uh, we have a different stem, but there are the, 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 the two possessive forms encode the same orientation. So ngush kash with the ng possessive is my side facing towards the higher interior side of the mountain and uh, the so or, uh, the opposite orientation means my side that is facing the lower exterior side facing the river uh, is that for that is okay so so just imagine you are here in the mountains so we have a river that runs here from here to here so we have up river down river and we have higher interior side close to the mountain and we have the lower exterior side facing towards the river okay. and this actually this is a way which a Garon people with which a Garon people would tell you about their uh it's uh, his or her locations in the mountains and with this picture so here we have a picture so we abstracted from the local landscape so we have a slope mountain slope here and we have the river just uh, running across below and we have the vertical dimension now the uh in this so in this slide we will not talk about the vertical dimension just focus on the uh, axis two the mountain slope and axis three the river so we have the four points a b c d so for this person we can see that point a that i mentioned just now is the side facing um what is it, facing the higher interior part of the mountain coincides with his front front side right and the lower exterior part towards the river coinciding with the back side and the, the C, sorry. Okay, C and D, up river, down river. So for English speaker, maybe you will use front, back, left, right. And I think perhaps for Mandarin speakers, also in this way. But for young people, instead of saying my left, my right, but possibly they would say my front, my back, but it is more frequent to see that they they will indicate their locations with my side facing uh, towards the higher inner part of the mountain and my side facing towards the lower and exterior part of the mountain. And it took me, really took me a long time to get used to this, this way to, 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 to express the, the, the locations. And one question for you that, what if I turn around? What if this person turns around? So now we have another different. So we have the second person here. So A, B, C, D in your eyes rep, uh, represent which part? Or so in the second picture we have also have the four points A, B, C, D, and the four points remain unchanged. So the A point, Nushkar the higher inner part of the mountain remains unchanged. A is also, in the second picture, is also the inner higher part of the mountain, and B also the opposite direction, the lower and exterior part towards the river, and C, Nwu, the Nene, is, uh, they, they remain unchanged, up river and the down river. So you may find that this, perhaps, this system resembles the cardinal di directions, east, west, north, south, so the four points remain unchanged. What change is actually it's our, uh, it's our location, right? Um, but I would say there is still at least one difference from the cardinal directions, uh, east, west, or north, south, because in Garon's sp spatial concept, with the pre prefixation of the personal possessive, remember the, pre uh, the, the prefix ne here, it means my side. The personal angle, is actually incorporated into the absolute reference, the local fixed bearings. Right? And I'm not sure uh, whether the English speakers here, they uh, you will say my east or my west. I'm not sure my north, my south. Perhaps it's more natural to just say in the south or in the north. Right, I'm not sure. But uh, I think for Mandarin speakers, perhaps to say or the Dongbian, my north, Perhaps we need a special context, right? Normally, we will say Dongbian or Xibian. I'm not sure. You have any? Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the first, um, perhaps the first difference is that incorporating the personal angle to our absolute reference systems. And the second is 
you will see later the difference from the uh, the, the the system taking reference from to local topography that they they are different from east to west because east to west and north south they remain valid no matter where you are right we have uh, so no matter if you are in Dublin we have east south uh, east to west and north south it's the same even if you are in for example New York right but in such kind of system taking reference from local topography, you will see late in later slides that different. Okay. So now let's descend the mountain and reach the river. So just now we, we examined the, the case in the mountains, and now we descend and reach the river. So the axis three, axis three, and I will remain unchanged. And I will always mean uh, upstream direction and under downstream direction. But axis two, so you may find the translation as higher part or lower part, interior, exterior, they do not work here because we are near the river. We don't, it's not necessary to say, to precise the higher and lower part. Instead, axis two, although it remains orthogonal to the river, but the meaning change. So, ado, so the same orientation now. Here, ado, it means this bank or the bank where we live or the bank where uh, our village is located. And the opposite orientation now are means the opposite bank. So you see up here, down here, lower, higher, they do not work here in this scenario near the river. And we have an example here. The spatial morphemes serve to describe the, uh, so in this example, we have different spatial morphemes that serve to describe the swimming pathway of a water monster. Uh, so a water monster. So uh, basically the monster, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So basically the monster swims like this way. So it swims first upstream and then it turns around and it swims downstream. So we will see how the Gamma people describe such swim pathway. Okay. So the speaker here as in, in addition to the mountain river reference, the speaker as an additional reference that is a rock in the middle of the river. Here we have a rock, so in the rock of the middle. And this additional reference is reflected by the possessive prefix, wo. So wo is a third person singular possessive means its. So it basically refers to the its means the rock, the side of the rock, as a particular side, uh, side or part of the rock. So we have corresponding to the ado, this bank where we live, we have a possessive form, which card means the side towards the bank where we live of the rock. So we have the additional reference here, rock. And the array, opposite bank, and we have the corresponding uh, possessive form, was jian. It means the side towards the opposite bank of the rock. So we will see. Uh, how this works. The first line, Jalarangu. Jalarangu means the rock in the middle. Jalarangu was Karsku Nanga. So the first half of the path is the monster swims in this way. So the monster, uh, sorry, Jalarangu was Karsku this part, right? So the side facing towards the bank where we live off the rock. So first in this side, in this side, so the, 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 the swimming monster swim School and Nanga means upstream. So it means the swimming monster swims upstream in the side facing our bank of the rock. Literally, it can be translated in this way. And then, and then the side, second line, we have Areni, Oskyami, Nanda. Are, this part, the opposite bank. Mi means downstream in the direction of downstream direction, and we have the possessive form, wuxian, wuxian means the, the side facing the opposite bank of the rock in the middle. So the swimming monster swim downstreams in the opposite side, in the opposite side facing the opposite bank. So in general, they would describe the pathway in, in, in this way, but I'm not sure for the Mandarin or English speakers, how would you describe such kind of, so we will perhaps we'll see 
swimming monster swims upstream in this side then it turns downstream in that side but it's not as precise as the are army or was 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 young it's more precise but um, for the modern speakers maybe Actually, this is a translation used by my informant. He indicated but actually it took me a very long time to, 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 to know which side is this side and which side is that side. So, and uh, so far, the situations, we, uh, we examined two situations. So one is in the mountains and the second one is near the river. And this situation pertains to the so-called local scale. What does the local scale mean? Actually, it means where the mountain and the river references function normally, right? We have we always have the local fixed bearings as a reference. We have the mountain always here, and we have the river always there. But how should these spatial related morphemes be used if the fixed bearing fail to work? So, what if a Gallon speaker, for example, what if they they are now in Beijing? How would they adapt this spatial related work, uh, morphemes to the topography of Beijing? Or what if they are in another village that where we, we do not have a local river, another village? Or what if, for example, what if a Gyeong speaker is inside our classroom? How would they use these spatial morphemes? So this is uh, the next part of my talk. So first we will examine the mini word the micro scale, that is, the orient how the orientations are used inside a house or inside a building. So this in image shows you a typical Gyeong house. So the let's just look at the most important part. So this part, the first floor. The first floor had, uh, has a very specific name. It uh, Actually, the Kie saves are the main living space for Gyeong people, and here we uh, we will see the spatial orientations are used independently of local topography and yet somehow fossilized. So this is, imagine this is inside the living space. This is in the kia, inside the, the, the room. So in the center of the kia, the living room, there is a typical tripled hearth here. And surrounded by four seats, each with its own name. So we have the first is kaku. Kaku um, so well, perhaps we can translate it as the innermost honorific seat for elder members or for lamas. Okay, then we have has card where uh, where firewood is added. So normally it is reserved for for the male head of the household. And we have the kati here. Kati is a cooking area typically used by women. And then we have the final kale. Kalia is a seat situ uh, situated close to the entrance, and normally it is uh, used by the children or other members. So there are four seats, each has its own name, and let's examine the etymology of the four seats, the name of the four seats. So among the four names, we can recognize some orientation nouns that we have already seen discussed in previous slide. So the first kaku, we have the second part ku that is etymologically related to awu upriver direction, and for kali, uh, sorry, kali, so li is a we have a new root that means wali middle, and we have kashkar. So you remember the famous nushkar, washkar, the the the, the difficult uh, the one that the, we have difficulty to find in proper translation. So the shkar means the higher interior side toward mountain or the, 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 the bank where we live. So we have shkar in Kashkar and we have kati. So kati, um, a, we find the roti in other related garun varieties as in the japu garun, we have ati as an orientation now means down river direction. So with the etymology, we can see that they they do not seem to have a close relation with upriver downriver in this case right or the side towards the mountain but so first we observe the fossilization of orientation nouns in the name of the seeds and second in actual use so each seed is also assigned with a particular orientation 
So if we want to go to the place of Haku, we would choose the direction for our destination of Wo, Up River. And if we want to go to the Kale position, so the destination is referred to as a downriver direction by the prefix ne. So if we want to go to the Kashkar seat, so here we have re and na. So you, so you can see we have a double fossilization. The first is the orientation nouns uh, fossilized in the, the seat names. And in actual uses, we have a different logic that each seat is assigned uh, with other uh, with, 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 with a specific orientation. Okay, now we have uh, we will show I uh, will show you the, the, the specific use. So the use of the four orientations in the living room is actually independent of geographic reality. Here I have uh, here is a is a documented house in Brawash. So we notice that the place Kaku. So just now I proposed the translation Kaku as the innermost uh, honorific seat. So Kaku is assigned with the upriver wood direction, but you can see with this figure, the, the actual location upriver uh, direction is here. So this is the, 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 the river. So you can see that wood is not related to the, 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 the upriver direction in reality, right? So the logic here is that here, we first determine the position of Kaku uh, based on which part do you know? Actually, it's based on the entrance. So Kagu is decided once we have the entrance. So Kagu must be located in the innermost part of the, 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 the living room and in face of the entrance. And once we have Kagu, we, uh, we have the Kali in the opposite direction. And uh, subsequently, we can map the orthogonal system to the uh, in, into the into the living room. So though the motivation awaits further investigation, um, this logic is shared by, I, I would say, the most of Garon languages. So I think for the the variety of Japu, I think uh, it is the same thing. So first we decide the entrance, then we decide the uh, uh, kaku, and we uh, assign the upriver word direction to the place of to the seat of kaku. And now, we will examine another case that local uh, fixed bearings lost, uh, became, uh, become, become invalid. So this is a macro scale. That is to say, we focus on a more large, or, 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 or we focus on a larger area, uh, the orientation, how the orientations are used across the region or beyond. So this is a map that, that is not very beautiful, but this is a map. Uh, map of corresponding roughly to the um, to present the Yarun speaking area. So there are many uh, toponyms. And the local references of the river and the mountain absolutely, uh, sorry, apparently they become invalid because we cannot use local mountain and local river to refer to the place that are far away, far away from here. So therefore, we encounter it is not difficult to imagine. We may encounter difficult situations or unpredictable situations, right? The picture, so for Brower speaker, the places here, I use different colors to indicate different regions. So we first, let's check the turquoise part here. One, two, three, four, five. We have five places that are indicated in the turquoise. So Brower, Brower is here. So it's here. So this place is the, 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 the turquoise place, the places indicated in turquoise are, uh, are connected by a river. So according to you, how would a Brower speaker locate, for example, this part in the upstream direction? So he will use upriver direction for this place. So if a Brower speaker uh, comes here, he would locate this place as in the downriver direction, and this is this place also upriver. Okay, but what about the green and the purple places? They are not, so Brower is here. The purple places here, they are located in another river, and the green places here are here also connected by another river. 
It's not the local river that running across that run, uh, runs across Laos, right? And based on my field notes, a uh, flower speaker would use upward or uphill direction for the green and the purple places. So it is not evident, right? <laughs> it is not predictable, I would say. And also, I'd like to say that the location referred to by Ra, the upward or the higher place, actually, these places are not necessarily have a higher uh, elevation. For example, we have a place Chukchen here. So Chukchen, Chukchen is here, the purple place. And I have my informant here in, in okay. I have my informant here near Chokche in Barkan. So my, my informant, um, said that he would say that Chukchen is uh, located in a higher place than than than, than Barkan, but actually Chukchen is about the same attitude about Barkan, but I don't know why uh, Chukchen it is con considered as a higher place in the eyes of local speakers. So this is actually an unpredictable case. And we have the red parts, that is the, 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 the five places indicated in red color. They are located far away from here, the turquoise ones. So these places are all referred to as lower places. Perhaps it is related to the topography, but not necessarily. So the first, we can make a first hypothesis is that the places referred to by using the vertical dimension up, higher, or down, or lower places. Perhaps there are similarly considered more distant, right? Because the the turquoise ones are referred to with the rivering uh, axis, up river, down river, and it is uh, quite obvious that these places are actually connected by a local river. But these places in green and in purple they are not connected by this river and are considered as as far away from the the the, the, uh, the speaker at least in in the eyes of the the, the brother. And here I have a table summarizing uh, the orientation used in different parts. So we have the turquoise ones orientation are river rivering. So these places, the the, the, the inhabitants of this place, these places speak the Sutu Garum. And we have the green ones, and it is uh, this place were once governed by the four chieftains. So Si Tu Garong Si Tu comes from Chinese Si Tu Si, the four chieftains. So they are the I would say the, the, this place were once the political center in old days, and the the green places and the purple places were governed by the four chieftains, but are considered away from the political center. And they, the, 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 the green parts, the speakers here, they speak Northern Gyarong. And the purple parts, the speakers speak West Gyarongig. The problem lies here. So, Kuo Chu, Chu Chen, Li Xian, and uh, Zan La, and so on. So, these red parts, the inhabitants here, they are also Sutu Gyarong speakers. But in the old days, they were not governed by the four chieftains, they are governed by their own chieftains. So we would uh, say there perhaps there is we can infer uh, we can infer the ethnic identity identity from the from from the orientation projection, and now we change to a larger area. So here I added some black arrows around the the Yarum speaking world, some famous places, and uh, so let's. First, look at Chengdu and Yunnan. So I believe you all know Chengdu and Yunnan. So Chengdu and Yunnan are all considered as lower places referred to by the prefix na. Uh, it is, I think it's easy to understand because normally the Han region are considered as located in the lower parts, right? And the 
more complicated case concerns the Tibetan speaking area. So first we have some Ando, uh, Ando places. We have Qinghai and Mzorgi. Um, so the two places are referred to as upriver direction used by the prefix Wu. But as you can see from this figure, we cannot see a clear connection between the two places and the river, right? And actually the local river uh, for a Brawa speaker runs from east to the west. Clearly, Qinghai and the Mzorge are not in the upriver direction in reality. And the Rasa, which is further, and Rasa is considered as a higher place. And I think this would be logic because, you know, Rasa is apparently higher than all the places mentioned here. So, however, they are also unpre sorry, here is a type is unpredictable case. It's not predictable because India is also considered as in the upriver war direction. So India, I think maybe we have, have India here because it's too far away. Apparently, India is not in the same direction as in Zurge and uh, Qinghai. So why? Uh, I don't have the answer for now, but I think maybe we can have, we can, uh, this should be explaining with more data. So I will conclude my talk here. So today I only presented a small aspect, a small part of the grammar of space in, in Gyarong with the, the Brawar Gyarong as example. Yet I believe it is sufficient to demonstrate the, the complexity and the uniqueness. It is also not worthy that these languages uh, feature other spatial references in addition to the topography based. So we, we also have the object centered uh, reference such as front, back, up, down, and the person centered left and the right and so on. But I would say that it seems that they have a hierarchy in choosing these different references. Topography centered references are the most prevalent. So it is most frequently encountered followed by the object-centered ones, like up, down, front, back. And uh, concepts like, like left and right are very, very infrequent. And I would say I only encountered the use of concepts of left and right in very specific con context, that is right hand and, uh, sorry, left hand and right, right hand with the Gyaro speakers. So okay, perhaps we can explore the motivation behind this in the future, so why they have such a hierarchy, right? Or perhaps we can have a hypothesis that if uh, for the speakers low, um, how to say, live in an area with specific topography, they would they tend to use uh, topography-based references, and so it's such kind of hypothesis. But this uh, is left for future investigation. And finally, due to the phenomenon of fossilization. I think this study could pave the way for future collaborative research in anthropology and history, enabling in inference regarding uh, early migration and the ethnic identity through spatial projection. So thank you very much.